now, here's your hosts, The League Dad, Kevin, Mitchell, and Alistair. Hello, and welcome to the All In Podcast. I'm going to be joined here today by Kevin. I am your host today, Mitchell. We do not have The League Dead. We do not have Alistair. They do not answer the call as they used to. It is only us two, but that's okay because this has been an incredibly dense, what, last two weeks, I think, since we did last of the podcast. Yes, so sir. much stuff has happened. So much stuff. Uh, to recap, um, we have not talked about C9 getting eliminated by 100 Thieves. Okay, that happened two weeks ago. We have not talked about uh, the group draw that happened, so we kind of know what's who's in play-ins. Uh, we haven't talked about, of course, the championship, which did happen. I think uh, Kevin is going to love talking about the, the finals games. Oh, absolutely, finals dude. I, I, yeah, we're going to Worlds. <laughs> we're going to Worlds. Yeah, that's, that's a good oh, silver lining. God. Uh, and then we have to talk about, uh, we can talk about a bit about the other, other regions, right? So Genji versus Hanwha Life happened. That was interesting. And of course, we now know who is leaving the LCS permanently. So all these topics will be dove into in this podcast so first let's start with the how are you doing kevin how's life what you been up to uh, i'm doing well i'm in michigan again to, for my first friend wedding so i've always gone to like you know relatives wedding but it was really fun um had a good time met a lot of strangers mm-hmm. not my favorite thing to do but it was actually quite fun and then i'm going back to seattle tomorrow so wedding was fun watching league was fun i've been having a pretty good time just being in a chill suburban michigan area yeah, you know, as a guy who's pretty much lived in a city all of his life, um, I, I sometimes really wish I lived in the suburbs every now and then, or like got to hung out in like more peaceful arrangements. Because the city is nice and it's fun, but it's like kind of you have an underlying level of stress that you constantly exist in. You know, yes. Like I'm, sh- I'm sure you got this in San Francisco, right? Like you're constantly a little extra paranoid. You're gonna get like. Something's going to happen. Some, I put yeah, my phone down for a second. I'm like, oh, someone's about to take this. So I'm like, oh, every, always yeah. on guard. Exactly, right? And then I actually grew up in a suburb, and I used to just leave my front door unlocked, and it was fine. It was not mm-hmm. a big deal. You can't do that right here. So, um, yeah. All right, let's talk about League of Legends. That's enough about us. Uh, let's, let's rewind all the way back. 100 Thieves beat C9, right? So 100 Thieves... They had a crazy back and forth series against Dignitas first, uh, where Dignitas almost actually beat Hundred Thieves, and they got a uh, reverse swept or not reverse swept. They got Dig Baron. Um, mm-hmm. That was rough. Do you even remember that series, Dignitas versus Hundred Thieves? I mean, it was Game Five. It was like the most Dignitas way for a for a major series to happen. But honestly, like after what happened after that, like that was like the beginning, right? I I thought. My major takeaway from that was that I thought 100 Thieves wasn't a team that could do it. Because I didn't think yeah. Dignitas was a team that could do it. So yeah. it gave me this impression that, you know, I was like, oh, 100 Thieves really struggled there. And, like, it was a fun match. It was a clown fiesta. But I didn't get the impression that this was, like, the makings of a world's caliber, like, a world's ready team in the face of C9. Yeah, I have to agree because uh, there was not a clean series by any means. It definitely felt like it was too bottom of the barrel playoffs teams like not not bottom lcs teams but just like you know there was the gap between the top three and the rest of lcs that everyone's been talking about all split long um yeah sorry kevin just to cut you off your the typing is actually is oh it's really loud okay i was trying to open game of legend Mm, okay i'll use on my phone it'll be quieter then yeah yeah, sorry sorry (laughs) you can just i i thought that this thing would cancel it but they don't cancel shit i think you can just hear it (laughs) yeah i think you just hear it yeah it's okay so um all right, so uh, counting down in three, two, one. Okay, three, two, one. Uh, yeah, so Dignitas uh, versus Hundred Thieves. It was very close and back and forth, but honestly, um, it, it didn't. No one would have seen that and thought Hundred Thieves would just go ahead and beat C9 the next day, right? Um, I think I jokingly didn't jokingly, but I think I predicted Hundred Thieves to beat C9. I think and you it did. Was kind of, yeah, it was kind of like a Hail Mary <laughs> prediction where it was like C9 doesn't really look very put together. They don't look good at all. But neither did 100 Thieves. Like, my argument was that, um, you know, honestly, it was just going to happen because <laughs> I was going to predict it. And it kind of did. Uh, but watching the Dignitas series, like, it didn't bring me confidence that 100 Thieves was going to do it. 
Uh, but I guess we didn't need that. Honestly, didn't need that at all. Any any last thoughts on Dignitas? I mean, let's just kind of sum up their experience for this year. Because um, we're not going to be talking about it anymore. They are going to be in LCS next year. But I doubt any of these players are going to Most of these players aren't going to stick around on that roster. I don't know. We'll see. What do you think is the future of Dignitas and these players kind of thing? Mm, I think that Jensen is still going to be on a team, even if it's like one of the two add-on teams. Like I think he is still the caliber. Uh, I think generally there's just even yeah. I don't I don't see why they would want to be here though. Like uh, like it just feels like no matter what you put on that, like this roster on paper has the talent. Like don't let anyone gaslight you into thinking that this doesn't have the talent. Like Zen is probably the reason C9 is not here in in, in the worlds. And he's on this. He's played actually really well at the beginning. The, the degradation of gameplay is mostly a mental thing. I refuse to believe. Okay, maybe outside of Licorice and like he might have just actually been really rusty. But there's no development, right? There's no cohesive mentorship and strategy and coaching staff that's like doing the right things. They might have legally speaking, they have to have coaches to be an LCS guys. But that does not mean <laughs> they're doing anything. Anyone who's ever done coaching or been coached in their life for a sport, for esports, maybe for your clash team. You know the difference between someone who's actually providing value and someone whose title is coach, right? Yeah. Like, right. So, I think that it would be a surprise if more than so. If if two people stay on this roster, I'd be surprised, even with the job security. I think the job security is the only reason uh, anyone would stay. Yeah, yeah. I, I like, or it would just be they have no other choice, right? Uh job security and that you know they know they're going to get signed or they really couldn't find anything else um i actually wouldn't be surprised if spika wouldn't be able to find another team elsewhere not that i think Spika's bad i just think spika isn't great he's not like this up-and-coming hot talent that is being desperately sought out and decided to stay with tsm right i think his biggest mistake was after double if left is he stayed on tsm with that like sword art roster and lost and uh Huni and stuff like that i think if he and power people right i think if he hadn't stayed on there that team barely missed worlds and stuff like he was just stuck in tsm purgatory um he had a chance at FlyQuest, but that seemed like FlyQuest, I mean, that fell apart beyond Impact's control, almost. And so I do see Spika, he's probably going to be stuck on a bottom tier team or not be an LCS at all, uh, which is unfortunate because I do think he had potential. I don't know if he still has, probably does, just not the same as it used to be. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think the other players, like Jensen, definitely, Zven, definitely, um, Licorice, probably, but Isles, I also feel like, did not have a great representation uh, on this roster and i wouldn't be surprised if he didn't have a team next year or was stuck on the dick toss roster again so that, that's my two guesses for for uh this dick toss roster yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i think that's uh, reasonable all right so we can we can let them go off into the dusty night we will not talk about dignitas probably until next year um so let's move on to 100 thieves beating c9 oh my god so I don't, let's talk about the match, the series. Um, it was not really even that close, if we're being honest. Uh, I think the first two games, uh, you can kind of see it going back and forth and be like, okay, 100 Thieves wins game one. Pretty like, sloppy throw from, uh, from Cloud9. This is the... Uh, everybody's talking about the draft for Cloud9, and I think that they're all right. They're all correct. That C9 drafting Nidalee LeBlanc... Uh, in game one with Renekton and Misfortune Alistair, that is a hard early game comp that doesn't scale into anywhere. They got mm -hmm. really, really far ahead, and then it didn't matter. And then 100 Thieves had Maokai, Corky, Ziggs, Cassante, Rel, Giga scaling, uh, and they just <laughs> lost, right? Um, so, um, yeah, did you uh, watch uh, any interviews with Blabber? So he actually gave out a couple. Yeah. The one I watched was the... the the sack down, I think, with Dom and yep, uh, sack down. It was a yeah. very long interview. I'm surprised he took it the day after. Yeah, I watched the entire thing. It was very interesting. Yep. Um, Me too. Yeah. What did you think about that interview? What did you think about Blabber kind of and the bit of a, the Cloud Nine series? Um, yeah. Because so, he did talk about the yeah the game. Yeah, I, I think I'll just break into parts and we can go back and forth. So it's not just me giving 20 minutes of exposition. But yeah, yeah, props yeah. to him <laughs> for taking the interview. I think it really does say a lot. That whole interview says a lot about Blabber as a professional. Like he does 
what needs to be done. Like if he says, I will come to this interview, even if he just got like the worst upset in the last like two, three years, he, yeah. he came and he was a good guest. He spoke a lot. I think what I got from it was that he doesn't feel like it was any one thing. I feel like it was like an amalgamation of a lot of problems in C9 that led to this point. And mm. I also got the impression that he doesn't have the leadership to be him. He's always been the jungler on C9, but when has it ever been Blabber's the shot caller? Like, he's gotten smarter. I'll give him that. His jungling has gotten smarter, but I've never felt like he was the leader of this team, despite him being yeah. one of the most senior junglers in all of us. Is he the most senior? I think so. Jungler yeah. at this it's point? It's either hip contracts. Contracts, contracts technically, but contracts, yeah. it would take time off, right? Uh, from yeah, yeah. top level. So, yeah, yeah, so they're like one most senior, right? But he's never been the leader, ever. And so. Not and he doesn't have to be right there. That could have been filled by a support, <clears throat> uh, and so I I think he was a really genuine and like I liked a lot of this and that he was willing to share a lot. But just not to go into any one detail, but more so like the overall feeling. Like I was like, yeah, this doesn't feel like the guy who was making the calls, right? It felt like he was kind of a passenger and he could not just control his fate. And that's like that alone as a jungler, and we're both jungle players, like. Yeah, that is a huge disqualifying factor for you to be the the goat of your region in jungle, in my opinion. Even if he has, he's still probably one of the best. But it's hard for me to say he's the goat when he's a passenger in some ways. Yeah, uh, it definitely when you compare it to players, I think in past that uh, are all those junglers. I mean, it's fairly similar, right? X Smithy is a passenger jungler, right? Yes. The, the person making the calls on that team was almost always double after core JJ or impact or something like that. Um, you think about Sven Skarin, he was probably a passenger, right? That team was notably shot called by uh, Bjergsen, double if Hanser sort of stuff. So yep. I, I think it's weird that it happens like that. But I think when you look at the world and you look at the meta, like from other junglers, it's usually the jungle support call and everything. But for NA, it hasn't always been like that. It is, it, there's a fair amount of 80 carries shot calling, which is interesting because it's just double, <laughs> right? But it's interesting that, yeah. um, that those are the in game leaders, right? And I think there's also a difference between like shot calling and in game leader, where Blabber does some shot calling, right? He has to. He's a jungler. He has to. <laughs> he does some early, probably a lot of early game calls, a lot of objective calls. But in game leader, that is definitely not him. I agree, agree with you. That had to be Zven. 100% was Zven throughout many, many years uh, was Indian leader, right? Uh, in that interview, uh, they did. he did also talk about the Perks roster. I bet you Perks was an in-game leader for sure for that team. Uh, undeniably. And, <laughs> undeniably, right? And then so when you replace Zven with Vulcan, and I don't think Vulcan is an in-game leader, right? If we look at uh, Vulcan's past success, the in-game leaders were Zven when he was on Cloud9, or it was inspired in Impact when he was on EG, right? So um, I think that this team actually just straight up did not have an in-game leader that you needed, right? I even think if you look at the last year, Emenez, he was talking about, was actually an in-game leader of a type, of a sort. Mm -hmm. And... This is the craziest thing to me. Blabber said Eminez was one of the best players he's ever played with. Ever. And that... <laughs> yeah, his, right. He said that. And Eminez's <laughs> his problem was that he would just mega tilt if they lost ever. He just could not fathom losing to T1 at MSI. And it mental boomed the entire team for the rest of the year. Can you imagine the ego on this guy? He's actually good, but he loses to T1 and mental booms. I'm like, come on, man. You can't it's okay. losing to T1. That's yeah. so funny. I forget. Oh, okay. No, I know why. I was listening to this while um, working. Okay, never mind. I was like, I feel like I, I don't remember this, though. But no, I was working out. So Hey, I... that's, that's how it goes. Apparently, he just mental boomed for the rest of the year after MSI because they kept losing to, like, Asian teams. And he just couldn't get it back together. He, he lost trust. Like, apparently they all lost trust in each other on the NMS roster. And they just had to stick with it all the way to Worlds, right? And it was a pretty pathetic end of the year for last year. Um, very interesting. And now we go to this year. We, we went on a tangent because it was a very inter interesting interview. But I want to talk about this game. Uh, the game one of Cloud9 vs. 100 Thieves. Blabber talks about it and he says, hey, we were up 5, 6K. It doesn't matter what draft or what comp we have. We should have won the game and it's our fault we lost. And yeah, um, I I got to say I disagree. 
kind of on a fundamental level. I think as a player, you really want to be able to say this stuff where it wasn't draft dipped. We went into draft. We trusted what we had. We made mistakes in game to throw away a 5k lead. And I just have to say from a viewer's perspective and someone who's also played the game for a long time that there comes a point in time. It doesn't matter if you're 10k up. Draft dipped <laughs> overcomes money, right? Draft yes. dipped overcomes income by a huge margin we were talking about in the last podcast how sometimes it feels like you can get a gold lead and you can get dragon skull and you're playing against a smolder and it does not matter i feel like that's happened so many times right and they're playing leblanc nidalee into quirky maokai like it is the biggest dichotomy of you will stomp the early game you could give this team twenty thousand gold lead but if the Corky has three items, you still lose. Like, and the Maokai has two items, you still lose because that's how scaling in League of Legends works. So, um, very interesting perspective from Blabber on the draft. Um, yeah, let's keep talking about C9 versus Hundred Thieves series and just overall yeah. C9 and their implications. Yeah, uh, and, I'll quickly else? tag onto that. Yeah, I, I think one thing that Blabber said, right, and something we can just glean from not even what he said, but like what didn't get said was like a lot of these decisions are straight from the players like they want that you know like it, it's almost i don't know if he explicitly reported this but like the leblanc picks that's got to be jojo being like that's i want to carry right yep, it has yep. to be jojo there's no that's way reaper right. well i don't think so there's no way the coaches were like they saw game one like yeah let's let's do it again game three let's go yeah. um so i i don't here's the difference right you as a player can believe when you pick them right it's actually very common more often than not i would say 75 to percent of the time when you go into a draft if it's player led, seventy five to eighty five percent of the time they say, I wanted this. Like I think this is best. But like yeah. players are stupid, guys. Like they <laughs> it's like actually very common for players to be like, This feels good to me that I get to play, you know, I get to play a carry jungler, I get to play something that's like really high tempo. And you know, that's why Renekton's like a huge thing too. Versus, you know, I don't want to play Maokai. Like I'm not gonna be a superhero if I play Maokai, even though Maokai's like safe, tanky yeah. initiates. One of the strongest alts in the world, Saplings, bro- like you know, right? For the yeah. longest time, these boring ass characters like Ivor and Maokai weren't played, not because they were bad, it's because people didn't like playing them. And I think that's yeah. so. When you ask, like, why did we not pick Maokai a single time on Cloud Nine when we had all these characters that would synergize with it? I don't think you can then say our draft was fine. It wasn't a draft. It was us. Like, I think he thinks he's being charitable to himself, but I think he's actually misguided. Um, and then on top of that. To say the actual series, also Vulcan's like, I, I would be surprised if Vulcan's on a top roster after this split. I think we've given him enough splits and enough chances, and if he's not with Inspired or another like top player to carry, I actually don't think he's it. He might have the hands, but like that's a lot of ifs for support. Like if your jungler, if your franchise jungler is Blabber, you can't have Vulcan. That's how I understand it. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely think something broke on so many players in that FlyQuest ninth place iteration. Like, I think it broke Prince. I think it broke Vulcan. And I think it broke Spica. Like, legitimately, that split, that roster, FlyQuest 2023 <laughs> ninth place, like, murdered three careers. I don't know how. Impact somehow came out of it better, okay? Impact, Impact rose from the ashes. Literally, just, like, he ignores all damage. He goes unstoppable. He, yeah, he, he he just he said, fine, ninth place, we're good. We're going to go win the split next 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 time, right? But, like, for the other couple players, they just seem to, like, go straight downhill. And Vulcan is one of them where, like, he was actually looking pretty decent in spring. And there was a collapse, obviously, for the entire team. But you couldn't pinpoint Vulcan. Now mm-hmm. you can actually pinpoint Vulcan in the FlyQuest series and in this series. Like, I was straight up running it down. Like, you can now pinpoint the fact that Vulcan is getting gapped by Ayla, which was, this was the trash talk, man. This was the trash talk from all of last year. The no handshake, the fucking stare down, the, just the back and forth. So many pros episodes dedicated to them. And Ayla is just taken into the bank, right? I don't even think Ayla played that well, if I'm being honest. Ayla had his very own share of running it down in the series, but, um, man, Vulcan was, was a dead, seriously dead weight. Um... So, yeah, there's that. Uh, let's go back to JoJo. I want to circle back to him. So, I think he did... I think we were all alluding to it where he was playing worse and worse. He he went from, like, actual 1v9ing uh, last split on, like, Nico and stuff, making, like, the crazy five-man engages to barely keep C9 in a game or something like that, to yep. being a serious liability. Like, his champion pool, 
whatever it is we think it is, right? I actually think it's probably pretty big. He just wants to play LeBlanc because, according to Blabber, they were stomping scrims so hard on LeBlanc that, like, it felt like all their information is telling them, just pick LeBlanc, stop early game. They were nearly undefeated in the regular season doing this thing. They're nearly undefeated in scrims doing this thing. Just do it. It's 100 Thieves. They're a bottom tier team, and they get stuck with LeBlanc Nidalee and LeBlanc Ivern, okay? So, like... I do think that, like, this was a problem of just a negative feedback loop and, like, them not... Like, Reaper needed more power. I actually do think, like, my initial knee-jerk reaction, like, after the series was, dude, what the fuck is Reaper doing? And I actually think now, after hearing the interview and thinking about it more, they should have given Reaper more power. Because you know what Reaper would have done? He would have been like, no, just play Corky, you dumb fuck. (laughs) And then you win! It's 100 Thieves, guys! So... That would have been it. Um, I actually fully, firmly believe if Cloud9 just played boring scaling, they would have beaten 100 Thieves easily. Because, let's, like, if you review the gameplay by 100 Thieves, they did not even play that well in their series to take down Cloud9. Mm-hmm. Cloud9 was just that pathetic. Um, <laughs> like, like, uh, let's, like, just the, the game three, right? Look, JoJo is playing LeBlanc, he goes up three and zero. And he is so disrespectful, right? I think he could have played so many of those fights so much better. So everybody's talking about it's so hard to play against Maokai and Rel and all the CC as LeBlanc. I agree. It is. But it's actually doable. There's worse CC to play against as a LeBlanc, right? Like, there's no Twisted Fate or, like, Pantheon or, like, actual instant Mor- click. Oh, well, there's also Mor- or Morgana with Maokai. Well, Morgana... Morgano has but... black black shield and stuff like that, but like mm-hmm. so Maokai is pretty rough because you can just press W on her and he he'll travel to LeBlanc. Yep, but LeBlanc can but no, but LeBlanc can still press W though. She she can play with that travel time, right? But there's lots of champions where you have no travel time to play with. You just get F'd as LeBlanc, right? Like LeBlanc and TF are ones I think of that are like the projectile's so fast, the stun, like you just get insta gimped. But JoJo's mm-hmm. playing very disrespectfully in that he's not Wing back, right? All he needs to do W in, Q, auto, maybe an E, jump back. But he's, like, jumping in, sitting around for a bit, doing two auto attacks, three auto attacks, and then he gets stunned after. I'm like, dude, why are you surprised? Like, you are playing so disrespectful. (laughs) So I really have to just also say that C9 could have made it better, could have made the shit comp work because their hands were better, but they actually were just playing badly. They were playing really poor mechanically. It's low APM, actual low APM. Uh, mm-hmm. So, very uh, disappointing. Um, also, wait, we gotta mm. talk about Berserker, dude. This guy's yeah, we can go ahead. this guy's Ziggs was abhorrent. This guy yeah. was like a quarter of the Ziggs player APA is. Like, I don't even know if they're on the same scale. Hey. It was so bad. Tobo, Tobo Ziggs was actually good, and yeah. you could see a direct comparison in the series where like Tomo was like, "Oh, your Ziggs is actually pretty good." To oh my god, Berserker is jumping in with his satchel in the wrong direction and dying. <laughs> he's missing his ulti. Oh my so god. <laughs> he's positioning hyper aggressively like he thinks he's Kaiso from like two games ago. Like yeah, it was it was rough. It was I rough. think if he's not on a hyper carry and the one game they won was on Kaisa, when he's not on a traditional hyper carry, I think this guy it's not a bad thing to be a hyper carry merchant, by the way. Like it, no. that's like still a lot of eighty carries. It's just not his meta. Like his MF was not impactful, right? He has all these mechanics, apparently and he, he has to keep playing on the edge to wait for alts. And then even if he alts, he doesn't choose his angles, right? Because he's not that kind of player. He's just yeah. not a role-playing AD carry. And that's fine. They just needed to identify that sooner and hyper-focus on slightly less meta, but carry AD carries as at least a way to band-aid. I don't think he's as good as he used to be compared to the competition anyways. But it wasn't doing him any favor. Like, why Why in the deciding game did you put him on Ziggs? Like, yep. what what data did you get from scrims? Like, what did he do? He can't possibly have carried. The way he played Ziggs felt like the guy who gets Ziggs on ARAM and just, like, is reading the spells. Yeah, I'll do my job, you know? Like, I'll just toss some abilities. How hard could it be? Oh, wait, I'm dead. Like, that, that sort of felt like... I do have to think that in scrims, it didn't matter what Berserker played because JoJo and Blabber were running the map so hard. That's probably yeah. why they got this information, right? He's probably if, just breaking turrets for them. Yeah, like, if JoJo is running the map so hard that they're picking LeBlanc in these horrendous situations and still winning in their heads and scrims and stuff, then yeah, it's gotta be the fact that Berserker just has to farm and stay even in bot lane, that doesn't matter. But when you get into deciding matches and you, like, I also think this has to be, like, a Reaper thing. He's just not familiar with his team. He's only had one split with them. 
um, he doesn't know the tendencies, right? I bet you if Zven and Mithy were in this team, they would have been like, okay, okay we got to change this shit up, right? Like, JoJo's kind of playing badly. He's kind of running it, right? Blabber kind of feels like he's not carrying on Nidalee. Put Blabber on Maokai, and let's put Berserk on a hyper carry, and let's scale to late and let Berserk carry. Like, they, someone would have thought of that in a team where they knew everybody's players' tendencies, right? We would have thought of that because we've been following this team for two to three years, but Reaper's mm-hmm. been off in, like, Japan coaching a different team, right? You know, um, Mithy left, Zven's not there, and clearly Berserker can't speak for himself, right? Like, if this was Double Lift, Double would have been telling you, no, everybody shut the fuck up. I'm playing Kaisa. I don't care. I'm not going to lose the series, I'm right? Lucian, I'm playing whatever, right? Exactly. But Berserker doesn't have a voice. He's not an in-game leader. Like, his opinions don't seem to permeate and actually affect the team. And I fully think that was the problem with literally every single player on this roster except JoJo. And JoJo's the one being like, I want to do this, I want to do that. And you're like, yeah, okay, calm down, play Corky, okay? Like, like put your put your little butt in the chair and play Corky, okay? No more LeBlanc for you. Like, no one told him that, and he got to run loose, and they lost. And now they're out of world's mm-hmm. contention. Um, man, this roster is so frustrating to watch in playoffs, right? They were fun to watch in regular season. Their FlyQuest series was incredibly frustrating, where they ran back the same drafts over and over again. And you know what they learned from running, what was it, Lilia, Cassante, Corky every game? They, they they ended up with this bullshit, where they're playing LeBlanc, Ivern. Like, they, they're, they, yeah, they they were very frustrating to watch this year. <laughs> no, this is uh, one of the, except for the Team Liquid collapse with Bjergsen and... Oh. Yeah, Bjergsen, Hansama, Bupo. Hansama, this is the yeah. high. This is the highest in modern history in terms of a collapse of a super yep. team, right? It's gotta like, be. Yeah, it's like this. The the Prince by Quest roster, but doesn't have the history, right? It has the hype, but not the history. Yeah. And then only Team Liquid was the worst collapse in the modern era, of like the last four or five years. I, I I actually am blown away by the level of the collapse relative to the competition right now. Yeah, I also think there's is one uh, 2020 C9 is the same thing. They had Niski. Uh, they were mm, like okay. they were they were like thirteen and zero in the regular split. There was a break halfway through the split. After that, they just kept losing and losing and losing. And then uh, they got knocked out of worlds by TSM, and that TSM went on to win worlds. Oh no, they got knocked out of worlds by FlyQuest, and that FlyQuest win went worlds? to finals. Or not to win LCS. Yes. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Am I? Did I just wake up in the wrong timeline? You missed TSM. something. You, you yeah, missed TSM something. Won a worlds. Years, okay? TSM They're won actually worlds. the dynasty team. The next they team won. <laughs> they went 06 in groups and then won worlds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remember yeah, that missed, time Fnatic made it out with two and four? Like that still blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. You could do it 06 now. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so there's there's a couple, but C9 is a part of two of them, right? C9 is a part of two of the biggest collapses in LCS history. Uh, for a top team so yep which is wild uh, it's c9 yeah it is it's blabber <laughs> it's been blabbered both times too niski i'm not surprised but yeah blabber is, is oh, no. back then niski for all of the memes we made of him he always made it in playoffs he was like the it was like the meme about my lions the meme about fin- it was a finagra my lions they just Fnatic always would make it no matter how shit they look they would make it to yeah. worlds yeah, and just, yeah. I mean, that's true. Niski deserves some respect, at least. We just like to meme him, because he's, he's in the EU now. If he was in NA, I would be diehard being like, no, I'm coping, bro, I'm coping. But Niski would be around. Jensen tier for me. He would be like, you know, this guy yeah. has the results. Look at him, because he's, he's in the EU. I'm like, eh, yeah. kind of a meme. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yep. <laughs> Let's make fun of him, yeah. <laughs> Last thing left. I'll say is, I think Jack will make the right decisions with this roster. The only thing that's up in the air is, will Jack make the blabber cut decision? Okay, okay, okay. Let's talk about that because it's really fun. We always love doing this. What are the changes for next year? Let's lock them in. What do you think? Prediction. We keep Thanatos. I don't. Okay. It's too soon. He has yep. potential, even okay. with the Shisho team. I cut Blabber to keep Chojo. Oh shit! I mean, you know how I feel about Blabber, and now yeah. this is solidified. And then I cut Vulcan. So I keep Berserker, Thanatos, and Jojo. And then I try to I try to poach and spider. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I, mean, way. I don't think we need to go that far into like the whole draft, like who we pick. But yeah. I think you have, like, you you beg Zen to come back. You're like, brother, don't be on Dignitas. You got a support role with us. You get yeah. Thanatos, Berserker, and your your pick of jungler. The yeah. world's your oyster. You have a super roster. Interesting, but like interesting. A, a real a good roster, not a dysfunctional one. 
Uh, this was supposed to be a good roster, by the way. I mean, this was. No, I agree, and like I still thought it was roster. a good roster up until playoffs. Like I, yeah. all the information we were given was this roster. Whatever the hell they were doing, it was working. You know, like maybe they aren't the smartest team, but they were winning with brute force a lot, and they would only lose to a team like Team Liquid in the final. That's pretty much yeah. how I felt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well. Didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so what? What are your roster moves then? I I, I spelled it out very clearly because I've been you did. cooking this. <laughs> You've been cooking this. I like that. I love the inspired thing because just imagining inspired and reaper together is probably the most the most breaking point thing. And you're a team liquid fan, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, inspired JoJo is a proven proven combo, and I think inspired on Z- in a roster with Zven would be the best content roster. I guess with um, Bupo, if he he took Thanatos spot, they would be the best yeah. content team of just, all time. You're just making what FlyQuest plus EG, right? Some 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 weird hybrid there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They work. I These see are it. unconventional rosters that saw results, right? I see it. All right, here's mine. Here's mine. Okay. 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 I actually think you keep Thanatos. You keep mm-hmm. Reaper. I think you keep Reaper and Thanatos. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. I think you keep Blabber. Okay. I'm actually pro Blabber. Okay. I think you get rid of. I think you get rid of JoJo. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm anti JoJo. I don't think JoJo's bad, and I think JoJo deserves to be on a team. This is just not the team for JoJo. I don't think he costs the most amount of money. Apparently, that also mm-hmm. is yep. playing a part in my mind. He was the most expensive player in LCS. Probably why split. they had coaching cuts. Yeah, I think JoJo is too young. He has too much ego. He got everything given to him in his first split by winning right in his first split he was very good he won but let's be real he was hard carried by danny okay he was hard carried by inspired impact okay that's obvious right inspired impact were the goats and still are but danny had such an insane 1v9 in that lcs uh championships that it was like nobody else even mattered and i think jojo is good and he got he got to ride off that for years man He's still riding off of that that one split in EG twenty. No, I still push back. His EG one v nine when he was the guy who one minute showed that he was him. I I, I think an okay. NA mid point to that level with your team's that bad is crazy. Let me let me uh, let me combat that for you, okay? Because I thought of that regular season that happens during regular season. JoJo is the regular season merchant. He is the one v niner. He does not bring it nearly to the same level in playoffs ever since twenty twenty two. Okay, he didn't make uh, he, in 2023 on EG, right, when he got MVP and he was running the regular season, right? That super shitty roster had an insane win rate. Uh, he deserved the MVP for sure for regular season. And I think that you put JoJo on any team in regular season, he will run the laning phase. He'll be insane in scrims. He'll have an aggressive champion pool. But when teams get good and they lock in during playoffs, I don't think his style is very good. I don't think you just stomp laning phase and you just carry that momentum to the rest of the map. It's just not a rel- like you can do that once in a best of five, mm. and you can do it against teams that you're you're significantly better than that. But it, is he ever gonna do that against Team Liquid or FlyQuest? Like no, because they can play around it. Their mid laners are not a bunch of schmucks that are gonna get ran down by LeBlanc. I just don't think his playstyle works when it comes to like actually being a reliable carry as a mid laner. Because when mm-hmm. I look at late game JoJo, late game JoJo has always been sus. So, actually, yeah, that he... might explain why even peak EG went 06 against G2. Yeah, because oh if you God, think yeah. about it, right, teams that are much worse on paper, right? Even Liquid, old Liquid, yeah. they would just take games. Like you play six games against G2. I promise you, even like okay, maybe not. Eight, uh, Harry, Harry Yan Team Liquid, but like teams that yes. have make it, made it right in the past yeah. have had random upsets. Like the old Team Liquid always took like went even with G two randomly at Worlds, yeah. or with like Dong One even taking the game. Like, but would this JoJo ever do that? Um, the JoJo EG probably not. Like they okay, they took the T one game, but that was Danny. Just yeah. like Danny had that factor, which helped, yeah. which was a good synergy with. JoJo being good in lane to bridge your AD carry there, right? They had like exactly. lightning in the bottle and it was all coincidence. But yeah, no, I okay, I like that theory. If he stays in a top team, we could we should explore this. Yeah, he, we, he's just it's so hype, right? The regular season's most of the season, and you always get sold the bill of goods. But then you take the car off the lot, it's playoffs time. What, what the hell? Yeah. Where are all he's these just, broken parts? It's like it's just, just fine. Yeah. 
<laughs> just run it. When your car just runs it, you he's know just, that's not it. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Yeah, it's just, he's, you know. He's okay, been that's running. a great theory. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I you think, changed my mind. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hey, okay, there you go. I mean, like, also, I think Berserker was supposed to be, like, a more consistent Danny, right? Someone you could rely on to be that 1v9 carry. JoJo carries you through the early game. He's aggressive. He's bringing pressure in the mid lane. And then Berserker is supposed to take you over the finish line, but they just put him on Ziggs. So they just threw away the entire game plan anyways, right? I think the roster was built well initially, but hmm. the way the team kind of got organized and the way the team kind of developed, right? They never got to this point where in the late game, where JoJo's not as reliable, they needed Berserker to 1v9, and they just never set him up for that. And he wasn't playing up to that standard, maybe to warrant that as well. So uh, I'm getting rid fault. of JoJo. You can't, you can't have the scrims, like, you can't start being worse at scrims randomly. Like, how would you know, right? This is like, yeah. they're probably the ultimate example of the scrim demon team that just, like, gets all the wrong signals. Yeah, right. Because you're stomping everybody in scrims, but then you realize everybody's just like formulating strategies. Like everybody's formulating strategies to how to beat you, and they just skill for late. And they're like, okay, take your 5k gold lead. You're playing Nidalee, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> um, okay, yeah. cool. Uh, T9 so, got most of this episode, but I think it was very warranted because yeah. you know, how historical this is. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Anyways, I didn't finish my roster. I'm keeping Berserker, and I'm getting mm. a new support. Yeah, uh, new support. Just throw Zven back in there. I don't give a fuck, dude. <laughs> just yeah. okay, get so back we, in there. We, yeah. we, we just disagree on the Blabbers JoJo yeah, the part, Jojo. but yeah. I am more converted. I think I I still give it another chance just because I think it can work. You I just think it need can better work. jungle support. I, like, think I would love need, to see yeah. Sven, Sven on the same team as JoJo because like yeah. the brains and leadership and the hands, right? And yeah. you can actually learn from a leader. Yeah, and I think if you give Reaper to a full, like, another year to work, like, dude, he didn't have much time to cook with this, like, disaster of a roster, right? Like, I no. do think Reaper is still and always will be a good coach, and he doesn't know his players that well, honestly. I don't, I don't really expect him to, right? One of them is brand new, Thanatos, complete rookie, and the rest he just met. So, uh, besides Blabber, of course. But, uh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> All right, let's C9. Let's C9. Let's, let, let's move on to 100 Thieves versus FlyQuest, right? We got the rest of the weekend uh, finals weekend to go through. So, this was a pretty pretty clear stomp. Um, I think that there was no world where 100 Thieves ever beats <laughs> FlyQuest. Um, I, I think that this is a much more dramatic than even 100 Thieves versus uh, Cloud9. Because I think everybody but a couple p few people predicted uh, 100 Thieves to beat Cloud9. I was one of those few people, but that's because you could actually see it. You actually saw, um, you know, Cloud9. The angle? Yeah, you saw the angle. Cloud9 dropped to FlyQuest and it looked pretty disappointing, right? They got outscaled every single game. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could see it with 100 Thieves too. Oh, we didn't even talk about TL versus FlyQuest the first round. Um, oh, that's fine. Shoot. Yeah. Hey, wait Honestly, a minute, wait a minute. That's not fine. This is a, this is a big, big match. That's big a match. TL1? Okay. We're even right now. We're even. We're it's 1-1 uh, one, one in series. It's 1-1. One, one. Yeah, okay, okay. True. We got to play another one, right? To, to best mm -hmm. to round it out. All right. Yeah, well, where's the reset? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same melee, bro. The same fighting games. Um, uh, uh, so Team Liquid versus FlyQuest the first time around, I think. Uh, let's not go too much into it, but we can yeah, talk okay. about how i think i mean tl just looks pretty good through the series i think that uh spoilers you know because tl did lose the finals that tl looked so much better in this series than in the actual final series which is just a consistency issue right um i'm not really gonna like say tl's bad because they lost to flyquest in the finals after just beating them it did feel like on this day tl showed up and flyquest showed up and this was the team's power level being played at. Um, I'm going to have a take about the finals, but mm -hmm. here's some spoilers. I don't think TL just showed up on finals day. Um, so let's let's talk about the first series just briefly. Uh, yeah. Notable notable things I'm, I remember is that Whippo played Renekton, and he looked really, really good. And then they banned Renekton, and he played Wukong, and it looked really, really bad. <laughs> uh, Liquid's, Liquid's yep. lane swapping was better. They knew how to make that Wukong completely useless because Wukong should actually completely dumpster tank top lanes like Asante if it left to their own devices. So yeah. I get why he picked it, but he just got destroyed. He got bullied. He even played yeah. the first dive well, but uh, in game five as Wukong, he held his W really well and like got a lot out of it. But like he was just, com they were completely out macro. Throughout this whole series, it felt like even on the games Liquid lost, there were so many moments where Liquid was getting more map control while down gold. Like it was ridiculous. Um, I think the gap was massive. 
I do generally agree that both teams showed up, and this was an amazing series, actually. There was, like, such a... It was a clash of styles. It wasn't, like, both played late to scale. Both had obvious strengths, and they were both displaying it, which made... Even though some of the games were only 29 minutes or 20, uh, 32 minutes, like, it was a fun series. I thought it was one of the highest levels of NA play that we had seen so far in a while, right? When we saw their best of three, it was also a banger. Um, yeah. So I loved it, um, and I think that FlyQuest showed what they were good at, and... If anything, I didn't. I think this maybe Flycus wasn't here a hundred percent because it did feel like they didn't know what to do with Whippo when he wasn't on Renekton, right? And they ha- they yeah. got more data points later, so maybe Flyquest came in in ninety five and Liquid at a hundred or hundred to ninety or something like that. But yep, that's yeah. all I have. Yeah, I definitely uh, did feel like also this was the series where Quad was like fully born. Like this is where we saw like, oh wait, Quad might be the best mid later in the league right now. Um, because he had that crazy pentakill on Zeri, and overall, I think APA was very consistent throughout the series. He was good, but Quad was actually putting up like next level performances. Where, okay, APA is very consistent. He's really good at playing the team, really good at playing with the map. Generally, a decent playmaker doesn't really inch. Like that's what APA has developed into a very strong mid laner. Quad went from this guy who could just play range AD carries very well mid lane, very consistent, good at playing with the team, very similar to APA. And throughout playoffs, he developed into a monster, into a huge carry threat. Uh, so I think this is the series, even though they lost, uh, where Quad went went giga. He went Super Saiyan, right? His Aurelian yep. Soul was really insane, and his Zeri was really, really insane. Um, so I, I think that was huge for the uh, FlyQuest series and was a huge precursor into why I think... Um, the finals for TL versus Fly was was pretty FlyQuest uh, favored in that it felt like FlyQuest had room to improve and Team Liquid kind of didn't show up on the day. So when one team goes up a little, one team goes down a little bit, so what is a very close matchup actually ends up being a 3-1, right? Mm-hmm. So still talking mm-hmm. about the... Well, so kind close. Kind of a 3-1. Almost no, a 3-1, three... yes. You little anyway, Coper. We'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> You're a little bit of a Coper, aren't you? Uh, no, no, okay. No, I think I'm. I have. I have my take. I'm gonna come in. <laughs> no, it's fair. It's fair. Okay. Uh, last. Last final thoughts on the first time FlyQuest versus TL played. I love your idea of the clash of styles because, um, it did feel like as time went on, hands diff in early game were always kind of a FlyQuest thing, and the late game macro was a TL thing. But wow, let's now just talk about. All right, we. FlyQuest versus 100 Thieves is not really much worth talking about, right? So let's just go into TL versus Fly the Finals. Yep. I do think that the script kind of flipped a little bit, okay? My initial take is it almost felt like TL was playing the early game stuff and FlyQuest was playing the scaling stuff, and it was up to TL to push the tempo, and they did not do it as well as FlyQuest would have done it if the roles were reversed. And mm. I think it was weird that TL put themselves in positions to have to push the tempo, start fights, uh, and not outscale, right? It felt like FlyQuest changed identities over time as they went into just, hey, we're just going to outscale you with our comps. We're just going to pick Ivern and play better. Uh, we're going to play Corky and play better and stuff like that and just wait. So very interesting. Uh, FlyQuest is a very interesting team. I really love watching them. All right, let's 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 get into the finals some more. Um Let's let you talk. I'll just let you talk. The floor is yours, buddy. Yeah, so game one, Liquid actually with a smolder comp, like, was able, or not smolder comp, a scaling comp. It was Ezreal, Corky, Maokai. Like, yeah. they were able to get a pretty decent early position. Like, they were not behind. And they actually had pretty good momentum until it was, like, 5-5 five, five or 6-6. Six, six. Um, they were doing well, and then it'll, that was when I was like, oh, yeah, you know, Liquid will just clean this, like, cleanly end this game, scale up. They were in such a great position. And then FlyQuest just turned it on. And never look back. Ever since that arrow caught Jan, I think it was, and then Olaf Whippo just ran in, got a pick, and then they followed through with an amazing follow up from Quad with yeah. on the Yone engage. I was like, wow, FlyQuest actually figured out what how to use Whippo is how I felt. I think that was actually one of the themes of like why they were here 100. percent Because in this series, instead of four games of Renekton, like his like. His like record going in was like nine games of Renekton or some shit like that. Like in yeah. the playoffs in general, up to up to like semis, I think he had nine games out of like twelve or ten. It was, was like, nine games in a row. Yeah. Consecutive. Yeah. Right? So like yeah. sure, but like that's not enough, right? In this series, Whippo, Olaf, win. 
Ergot. I mean, they, they just got stumped. But like Ergot, right? And then Renekton. And then Garen. He yeah, was... Yeah. I still think Impact's the better top laner. I think Impact actually, like, literally solo kill touch showed up yeah. on average in laning phase better than yeah. Whipple. Even when Whipple had, should have, like, the lane event, I was like, wow, Impact's yeah. just good at setting up ganks or just solo killing. But yeah. they were able to use Whipple as a positive force and a really strong draft X factor. Like, there wasn't really, like, what were you supposed to ban from him? What were you supposed to do? Because you have other threats, like Quad's playing out of his mind, right? Inspired is really scary if given jungle. Uh, picks that he wants. There's just uh, too many threats to ban for. Yeah. And so I think game one, uh, I'll just leave it at game one and two. Like, I think Liquid actually looked good in those games. And it was FlyQuest, um, especially game one, like just showed up. They, they actually showed their style, forced it through. And it was like the natural, like this was the natural progression that we saw in their first encounter. I'm like, wow, FlyQuest is the more aggressive team. They have the hands. And yep. in this comp, like they perfectly exemplified like there's just such a different goal between the two comps right liquid's more control scale a little bit more pokey control space and fly is like i land a pick you're you're so screwed like we yeah. will come from the right angles at the right timing and we will outplay you um yeah so i really love that part and at the same time though right FlyQuest's comp if they miss their engage they have nothing to fall back on they have no wave clear and they have no poke so TL has Corky and Ezreal and Maokai saplings. You get poked, you get you get chunked down, and then you can't even uh, walk into a fight. So the comps are very both very good, very strong, good at what they do, and very complementary to the styles. And mm -hmm. yeah, I got I just FlyQuest hit their engage, so their comp wins. If FlyQuest misses their engage, right, like Fly, or TL has all the tools to dodge the engage. They have Ezreal, Corky with dashes. They have cleanse. They have a Rakan who can block. They have a Maokai who can block. A Kasante who can block. But it, they just, you know, executed. Uh, Flakwish just executed the engage well. So yeah, I really like that call out and that the the comps really emphasized their styles. Uh, moving into game two, uh, this is where Impact was mega goaded. Uh, oh my god, he completely... Okay, this is a very Urgot favorite matchup. I don't know if you've ever played this, but for starting from literally level 1, Urgot poops on you. And then you don't get to play for a really long time as Jax. I think and... until 3 items, at least in the old Jax mode, it was like not playable until the 2 and a half to 3 items. Like you have to yeah. hit your levels, get the cooldown, get the items, and not be down 100 CS. And then you can finally 1v1 Urgot, right? And even then, if he hits an ulti on you, you could still get executed from like 30% HP. He's also but, the better team fighter in more scenarios IMO than old Jax, at least, like traditional Jax. Yeah. New Jax is CDR spamming, so he, he is actually pretty it's good team to fighting. Because he's just mm -hmm. helicopters everywhere. But I, I mean, Impact was just solo killing Bupo over and over again. So this is also another thing that I noticed in the progression of the series. The scripts really flipped. Impact is always considered the stable laner that team fights you well. Bupo is considered the psychopath in lane. He picks Darius and runs you down, right? He picks Olaf and runs you down. And he picks Urgot to, like, just win lane, right? But what kept happening is Jax, or Impact, was winning lane really hard. Lots of solo kills. Lot, like, there are so many solo kills from Impact in the series. I can't even count them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there was a He's lot. Goated, dude. He is, but it's so interesting that Blippo is, like, running it down, dying in side lanes, getting solo killed, getting caught, and is still more impactful in team fights. And I don't think that's, like, a knock against Impact. I think it's a knock against Team Liquid as a team and utilizing Impact, but it is a huge pro for FlyQuest in that they have this inting top laner who is still willing to team fight and they're making so many plays because you even go back to, you even go like looking forward to game three where um impact is actually solo killing Bupo on renekton versus gp like over and over again but Bupo is just running around with a stun setting his team up over and over again so much that like Gang plank is just hard to play in team fights. It doesn't matter if you're the best gang plank in the world. It's really hard to play, uh, especially against Seraphine. Oh my god, like Seraphine can hit your barrels from like ten years away. That's actually a really tough matchup. And it's really good for uh, for Seraphine actually. I, I like that, um, especially the Arabs, right? You just hit the barrels from a year like a mile away. So very weird. Blippo is just such an interesting enigma of a player. He runs it down. He's more useful in team fights. But he plays his lane, like he plays heavy lane dominant champions. Literally, Olaf, 
Urgot Renekton. He runs it down, and he's more useful in team fights than Gangplank. I just don't get it. It's fine. He does his thing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, like, imagine know. if he just knew how to lane. I don't know. This team would be crazy. <laughs> this team would be crazy. Imagine if he didn't get... Dude, there was this point where Bwipo is trying to shove a wave into Gangplank on Renekton, and mm -hmm. uh, Gangplank impact is holding the wave, right? So what Bwipo does is he ulties flash W's impact, so he has to get the wave shoved in. But it's like, dude, you just flash an ulti to just get a wave shoved in. Like, that's not worth it. Like, there's no way. And then the impact... So too. It didn't impact look like types... any brain cells. No, it just was like, what the fuck, you just got mad. And you just uh, flashed <laughs> in there. Uh, and impact types question mark in chat. And I'm like, yeah, that's a question mark worthy. Yet, impact <laughs> still loses that game, right? Like, win, lane, lose game. Uh, that was the epitome of impact this series. Um, but both right. is N.A. Doran. He... Yeah, well, I mean, day Doran won, exactly. So yeah, he is, lady, right? we always get confused if he wins a series. Like, what did he do to earn this? And I also got to say, this series did feel, like, so correct after watching Genji vs. Hanwha Life. It felt like the same series, almost. And, and that, mm. not not an execution or the champ select or anything like that, but in the fact that Genji was expected to win the entire year. They're undefeated, nearly undefeated versus TL undefeated in regular season. Mm -hmm. looking really good in playoffs they they're not missing a beat in playoffs to mm -hmm. showing up on the final day just a little bit worse than usual and their counterpart that's always been right below them right FlyQuest has always been right below team liquid for 95 percent of this year hanru life is literally considered gen 2 for 95 percent this year and then they win it felt like the same story almost man so hey just it sucks to be on top right everybody wants to kill you when you're on top right yeah. um that was Team Liquid. All right, let's talk about Inspired. We got to talk about Inspired versus OMT. I think this was the biggest gap in the series by far, starting all the way from Game 1. Obviously, OMT is on Maokai. He's going to be a behind in farm compared to Lilia for Inspired. But it felt like when the situation was flipped and OMT got the Lilia... Uh, was that the series? Yeah, OMT got Lilia and then Inspired was playing Ivern in Game 4. I don't know, man. Lilia, for Umti, he could not make it work. I don't think he played it very well at all. Um, I don't I don't think Umti played the just well at all the series in general, honestly. I, I think he was actually the main liability and why they lost the series. Um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts on Umti and Inspired and their matchup in general? I, I mean, you've always heard me. Even when Inspired was having really bad times on rosters, I've always said Inspired is good. Even when they were doing poorly, I think he's. I, I'll take that back. I think he's just. He he is him in jungle. Like yes. the guy is just the most efficient jungler in NA. He obviously has some amount of shot calling, and at the very minimum, like you can tell his ego and the way he speaks in the team. He's the kind of guy who says, "Don't do that. That's stupid. Like, why are you picking or doing that?" Right. Yes. So he doesn't work with everyone. He's probably extremely toxic for some types of mental, like mental states. Like if you're Weak mental like Danny, like uh, like uh, awful, bad matchup. But bad it's matchup. Very, <laughs> it's just very clear that he is he played and did more than Umpty. Like no amount of copium. No, I think Umpty is a very good fit for Team Liquid. And I'll continue to say that. But yeah. if Inspire was on Team Liquid, and assuming there isn't like a a fist fight culture yes. gap, right, or a fist fight <laughs> between him and Core JJ, right, and they all yeah. respect each other enough or listen. Like, you know. it, it would be a straight upgrade in most departments, right? There's very yes. little that Umpty does that is better than Inspire, except for he might be a good emotional pillar for the team, right? You have two yeah. rookies. He's very nice, good English, yep. also good Korean. Like, he, he has the experience, and he probably tilts a little less. But his yeah. skill, like, when he doesn't tilt, it's like, well, like, could you tell if he was tilted or not? I don't know. He's just not a, as good of a player, right? He didn't show up today, so he probably was a little tilted after game one. I think game one was a huge mental uh, hit because they should have won that game. Like in terms of the momentum was there, and then after one engage, it completely collapsed. So yeah. I think Umpty was outclassed, and I... he he that generally was the case before, but the team didn't know how to like. It was always Liquid being a little bit beaten up by the hands, and then just like incre incredible macro giga gap. But is it is Inspire worse at macro than Umpty? I don't know. I don't think so. Based on his history, I feel like he's the one who knows what to do, and he has to tell the others like, "Why is he playing Karth this year? Because he knows how to macro and mm. like play Karth this to hyper carry, and he can't yeah. trust his team." 
I I I hundred percent agree with all your takes, and I'm glad to hear it. From there's no copium. We're being real here. Inspired is just the best jungler in the LCS, and it's kind of not close because, like, if we're being honest, Inspired has had an identity of being a carry jungler for most of his career, but he, it's it has been because he's been on teams that are lacking the damage, right? When he has a team that he trusts in and he plays Ivern, it's actually the best Ivern in the league. Um, it's actually the best Maokai in the league sometimes, right? Or whatever supportive champion he's playing. And even then, right? So his versatility alone, being able to play Zyra, which Umti can't do, being able to play Lilia, which Umti can't do, but also being able to play Ivern and Maokai and Sejuani and all that stuff at the similar level, it, it, it's hard to just not have Inspired as the best juggler in the league. And, you know, it's supposed to, it, it was always supposed to be like that, right? Umti was never supposed to be the difference maker in these situations. Yes. It's supposed to be, Impact's supposed to be the difference maker. Quarter J's supposed to be the difference maker. So let's move on from Umti and Inspired, and let's talk about some of the other people that are supposed to be the difference makers. Um, I gotta say, Yeon also did not perform that great in this finals. Masu performed insanely well. Oh my god, was Masu good. Um, I think... Obviously, game one, his arrows were just sniper level material, just 100% at hit accuracy, just, you know, wall hacking. I think uh, Yeon had a great game two on the Callista and that he just, he had the opportunity to carry, right? It was uh, Senna and Callista versus Jin Rel. I gotta say, FlyQuest kind of boofed the draft. That was a terrible bot lane to play into the Callista Senna. Um but, you know, Yeon and Cordy J were put into a position to carry, and they put the team on their backs, like, alongside uh, Impact. So that's why they won Game 2. Uh, it was off. But then, looking at Game 3, man, Ash getting solo killed by a Seraphine? That is a really big problem. That's a big yikes. You can't be doing that. Especially because he had Flash up. You flash any of Seraphine's abilities, there is 0% chance she can solo kill you. Still All of her abilities... All of her abilities are skill shots and all very slow and predictable. Yeon didn't flash a single one of them. He got solo kills. He died. And that was kind of when the game completely fell apart, right? It was a sequence of events where there's a big bot play where Team Liquid got mostly wiped. And then Yeon got solo killed in the mid lane. And then that game and basically the series was over from then on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because Team Liquid was in every single game. They were even in every single game for most of the first 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but something blew up in the mid game. It's supposed to be Team Liquid Strength. It was not. So props to Masu. Biggest champion diversity, I think. Uh, Masu uh, play the Seraphine. He plays the Jin, Jin and the Ziggs. I, I don't actually know if he's played Ziggs, but he plays Ash and stuff. And I do think that you know Yeon is a bit of a merchant, right? He's got Lucian. He's good at. He's got Callista. He's really good at. Uh, he did play that Samira that once upon a time. Uh, but the That's rest real. of it. Yeah, Ezreal is really good at, right? But those are kind of his three big champions. I would say his Ash, I'm not a huge fan of. I'm not saying it's bad, but I haven't seen him play Ziggs a single time, right? Um, and his Kaisa is good. Oh, no. If you get yeah, Ziggs on that team in a draft, like, it would be stupid to give it to anyone but APK. But yeah, should give it to I, APK. I, I agree, though. I haven't seen it yeah. recently. And, he, and, you know, I haven't really, like, I think he has played MF, but it is in one of those times where it's like, hey, man, you're playing MF when your team's just making stomping. I can't tell how good you are, right? Um, so. Yeon, we did say he was kind of coasting a bit for the split because his team was mega stomping, and he actually had a really good series the first time him and FlyQuest played, but this time he he didn't show up, and I think that just happens. Like, we don't have to harp on, like, we, we're going to remove these players, they're bad. No. no, it's just, they just played badly on the day, and uh, we, we, can, we can identify how they played badly on that day. Um, yeah, other than that, though, I got to say, APA and Quid, they're kind of interchangeable to me. I don't actually think, like, Quad... Sorry, no, I said quit. Quad had a great series their first time around, but Quad in this series was kind of tame. I don't know. He was a bit of a role player. He just kind of went with the flow, I think. I don't think he did anything. Like he was the follow up, or the, he was the follow up, or he was the scaling, right? He picked three yeah. games of Corky and a game of Yone. In the Yone yeah. game, he had a good follow up, but he yeah. never did it himself. Yeah, yeah. He, he was very much just a role player, and I felt like APA was the same, right? But, hey, your side later... Hard, he kind of hard carried along. Actually, I think this Nasus oh. game, he literally 1v2. He like, just smacked yeah. their, their faces off 1v2, dodged the okay. Jinnal, and then just backed away, and just... Yeah, yes, that was, impact. That was hard I think carry. everyone but Umpty carried that game really hard, actually. Yeah, that's true. Uh, honestly, Nasus is 
freaking turbo broken. I'm so glad they're nerfing. But, but you gotta know how to play it. I've seen people yeah. play NASA spoiler, which is crazy to me considering his buttons are zero skill shots basically. Yeah. And as no, long no, as no, you yeah. know how to play him, you should be. Yeah. But I've seen people play it badly. Like they just no. don't know what their role is. Respect to APA, he's a competent player. He can play a dumb shit champion like now. He played it well, okay? He's very competent. I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, I also think his Tristana, man, if this was old Tristana, I think he carries some of these fights. I think he no, carries yeah. some of these games. It's just not. It's just nerf Tristana, and you could feel it. He was just, like, from what used to be an even matchup between Corky and Tristana, where literally anything could go is very close it's just a hard winning matchup for corky now he loses push and trades every single time it didn't used to be like this and i just feel bad that he was on tristana duty even though it was one of his best champions it's just nerfed and you could feel it and in no lethal series. tempo which is no a huge loss i mean uh this year there wasn't no lethal tempo right when tristana was good Lethal I think Tempo the first split there was. Lethal Tempo was removed halfway, right? Yeah, but Tristana Corky was the meta for like all of Summer Split, right? With Fleet. Okay, Mage, that's Fleet true, actually. Here. Wait, yeah. yeah, you're right. So he was, was it was removed a, halfway through? Or was I it think removed? it was moved halfway through, yeah. Lethal Tempo was removed at the MSI point, yeah. So okay. Tristana had uh, Lethal Tempo back then too, but she still played Fleet back then as well. Um, so, yeah. Oh, but that was also unnerfed Fleet as well. Yeah, it was also unnerfed Fleet, yes. Okay, so, got it. In this current age, Corky just wins, and you can see it. It's not APA's fault. You can't do anything to just win a right clicker, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he played some of these fights so well, and it just it just wasn't enough. So, uh, like, can't really hate on APA for that. Like, the only thing we can really talk about now, okay. And also, Buzio was insane. Actually, Buzio played a really good series. Yeah, he played uh, a good series. But I'll, I'll say before we talk about what we all know, we're gonna talk about <laughs> game two. Yeah, Core JJ and Jan outplayed so many times like the hands did like we it was hands versus brain for most yeah. of the series but game two the amount of skill shots that the amount of times that like core jj would land a st uh like a, a w on sunday they would just come back in and like all the micro checks that liquid won that game i was like oh they can play hands okay yeah. great and yeah. then they just it never happened again but i i I, 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 I was impressed they should have played more Callisto. I 100% think they should have played. I think it's his best champion. I think it's Yon's best champion by far. His Callisto is one of the cleanest I've seen just like in general. I mean, obviously there's He just looks like non-traditional AD carries. No? Hey, like, other Callista, than Lucian. Yeah. I mean, Callisto is pretty traditional. Callisto, Samira. Yeah. Mm. No, yeah, like she's, the... she's pretty unconventional. She's traditional, but she's unconventional. Sorry, that's uh, like unconventional. Okay. She like, is an unconventional weird mechanic. Right... AD carries. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I get what you're saying. She's not a normal right clicker, like Jinx or some shit, right? Yeah, she, yeah, she's, yeah. Uh, she's like half a melee right champion almost, right? Um, yeah, I can see that. What you're saying now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think Yeon definitely sh like at least the Ash game. That was like uh, they picked Ash because. Ash is just good, and it was early rotation and stuff, but just throw that guy on Callista. I think Cordra J also, he can play Senna with it, or he can just play a normal engaged champion, like like Cordra J always does, and I think it would have looked good. Um, honestly, not too many cl complaints about Cordra J, really. He really didn't no. do anything good, that good or bad. He was just pretty solid. In game 2, he was playing really well. For the most part, he was just playing solid and just felt like the main gaps in the series was just... Kind of jungle and a little bit ADC, and otherwise it was a really close series because we're gonna talk yeah. about it. We're gonna talk about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's we're game about four, it. okay, baby. Okay. Oh, I gotta go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> game four. Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> this is such a weird game, okay? Because pretty much it's actually an early game comp from Team Liquid, and it is a scaling comp from FlagQuest, okay? Um, Team Liquid, they have the Lilia. They're supposed to run over the early game. Uh, they have the Kaisal Rel, which is supposed to be an explosive engage comp where you just, every drag you fight, you engage, you win, right? Because they're playing against Ivern, they're playing against Corky, they're playing against Zeri. These champions are very fragile. They don't spike early. Uh, and T-Lamp goes ahead for most of the game. They're just solid. It's like the kills are two to one. They have a solid gold lead. They have mech control over everything. You, you're thinking in the back of your head, hey, you should probably push the tempo and get ahead more, but it's fine. You're ahead. And they just start getting ch caught. They get ch chain feeding, just caught here, caught there, dead, boom. And then FlyQuest gets like two barons, and they're just massively giga ahead, right? Something flips into Team Liquid where they realize they're about to lose the finals, and they just say, F it. We're engaging. We're fighting. 
suddenly out of nowhere they all grow balls and they just start engaging fights and it is not even close it is like FlyQuest is taking their base team liquid engages wins a five for zero fight and it's like you could have done this the whole time what have you guys been doing bros you trust like, when you almost got out scaled like past the tipping point to do yeah. like incredible fights Dude, five for zero mega engages. I was like, oh shit, wait, we're going to game five. We're winning. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that like Team Liquid's base is in shambles because they took so long to do it. And it's it's freaking another five man ace, five for zero ace. Flyquest tries to start Baron. And it's like, okay, five ace. It's great. T impact, he teleports half a Teemo over <laughs> to the wave. They were running it down. Oh my god, we're going to game five. The minions, the super minions are in the bot lane, slowly creeping over, and the rest is history, Kevin. You know how it is. Buzio, he comes in like Superman. He delays the minion wave by mere fractions of a second enough, because the Nexus would have been deleted if Buzio didn't yeah, do it that. It was like a half second away from being deleted. It was half a second, probably less, actually. It's like... Like, the auto attacks from late game AP Kaisa and Tristana, like, that Nexus would have died in, like, two autos, would have, which would have occurred in, like, 0.1 seconds. Um, the Winions take it, man. The Winions take it for FlyQuest. Literally, everybody the in FlyQuest. Winions won LCS. Winions won the last, the last LCS, LCS <laughs> game ever, man. It's the most insane ending to oh, this era. Is one of the most insane. FlyQuest gets the first trophy ever. They've been second place like five times at this point now. Um, I think four times. Yeah. Um, they Steal finally the win it. Then... Yep. Uh, they win it. Finally. They've been trying to win it for so long. FlyQuest, congrats to them. Well deserved. So glad they're in the league. I mean, if TL won, it would have been like, this is the year of TL. TL runs the LCS, right? They have the most championships almost. I think they, if they won, they would have been one under TSM. TSM has seven, six I think. Versus seven. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, but they didn't, right? Now, you know, TSM's going to have the most for quite a while longer now, right? At least two more years, or at least two more splits. Uh, yeah. if, if TL would have to win everything next year, it's crazy. It's so crazy that uh, this is the timeline we live in. Um, the Winions won, man. Everybody thought they were going to Game 5. Everybody on FlyQuest Everyone thought they were going did. to Game 5. Liquid Literally. thought they were going to Game 5. Oh, of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> all um, right, all right. I got I to gotta, I gotta speak get in up. Here. This is, get in here. It's so easy Talk to, to blame Liquid for this. I, here, here's the positives, okay? One, for the final LCS in history, right before the, the rework, the fans got the best game ever. Oh this yeah, I fucking the, the, if you were it, in dude. person, like I think at that point you name your kid like LCS or Mark Z or some shit. Like, <laughs> you, you're just like, this is my league. I will do or die till I till I leave this earth. If there are no more fans, there's then that's when I've left. You know, shit like yeah. that. Yeah, I think it was amazing. I think for hype for Star, like if Liquid goes to Game Five, maybe they still lose. But this was the best send off because it was so LCS. You know, such an intense game. All the back and forth, and then in the clowniest, most fiesta, <laughs> most memorable way possible, this happened. Yeah. Um, I will also say in Liquid's defense, I think it does show a lot about how much cohesiveness they have. And let me qualify that. Only a team as organized and on the same page would not back there. Because they made the call that we can DPS this down, and they're not wrong. Like, in most worlds, they probably expect it. Either one, they have the DPS, which they almost did by like half a second or less. Mm -hmm. Two, they probably expected the minions to spawn and just like cover, but because it was on the bot lane, the timing of which the minions took aggro meant that the two super minions just had a full pounding session on the mm -hmm. Nexus, right? It was like, it's, if you've ever had two super minions attack a naked Nexus with no minions to distract them, it's actually crazy how much DPS they do. Yeah. Um, so I think Liquid showed that like this is a cohesive team. They made the shot call like they pinged it. They were like, you know, this is here. We can do this, right? And they almost had the math, right? But like how many times do you actually have this scenario? We've never seen a minion end in like this before. Never. We've seen a minion last hit, but like this everyone's like, you know, dancing around or whatever, like they're nearby. They, this is literally just minions win. I've never seen it at a pro playoff game high stakes. Ever, uh, no, right? there's one. There's one. CLG what, the versus. Fanatic in... Oh no. No, it was a uh, CLG versus uh, TSM. I think it was Nien on um, 
Elise Top. I don't know if you remember that game. This was like I, I remember in the end playing Elise Top a lot. Yeah, Tansu. yeah, yeah. The, yeah, this was uh, and then um. They kept killing each other over and over again. They both had open nexuses. And then I think Nien got like a quadra kill in their own base as TSM was trying to backdoor. And as was that's happening, CLG's minions took down TSM's base. It was like really insane. And then Kennen, Dyrus was on Kennen. He tried to ult the wave and he didn't oh, stop it. The yeah. Kennen ulting the wave is what I remember. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, this yeah, did yeah, happen. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the only other time though. That's the only other time the minions just kill the base. But, but someone <laughs> backed. Someone yeah, backed. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. It was in the base Di race. It, so the first time a base race happened, but yeah, yeah. the the Nian one is iconic. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good crazy. God. But the minion, the minions, just... the minions won. The minions just. But I will say uh, all of that to say, I think with the way that was going, it was still completely fifty fifty. If they went to a game five, I think both teams showed their hand. Liquid found the confidence to like come back from being the idiots. Uh, through the mid game where they were like afraid to use their comp the way it was designed, and then when it was almost over, they just they just completely outclassed in yeah. team fight. So I was like, oh, this momentum will be really good for a good game five. We're gonna have a banger, but I mean, we did have a banger. <laughs> just, yeah, it just I. Um, the way and then I would say as a final thing, like G G Garen and Nasus just like being impactful in multiple places and multiple positions. Yeah, in maybe up to worlds, but at least in the local finals everywhere is like truly a moment in time for me like a uh, mumu too it's a mumu nasus garen the fucking bronze zodia <laughs> and mf too well not bronze yeah. zodia but the mf mumu like the fact that that's yeah. just a comp in 2024 blows my mind this is like season two shit yeah yeah this stuff's good man this stuff's op and you know what's crazy everybody just has known that nasus and garen have been op in solo queue for like five plus years like nasus mid with uh, Emax has been a thing for a really long time. It's always been OP. Just no one thought to take it to pro and be like, wait, this shit is brain dead broken, right? It's like no counterplay. You just spam E and you last hit and then you run it down. Same with Garen, right? Garen has been terrorizing solo queue for a long, long time. Like ever since Stridebreaker has been in the game, pretty much Garen has been uh, a nuisance. And yeah, it's because what happens is you get bullied for the first couple levels and then you just spin to win you just go to the wave you spin you run away and there's no counterplay you can't stun him because he gets tenacity you can't slow him because he's got phase rush and you can't outscale him because he has a true damage execute that scales off your missing health so pretty ridiculous stuff uh i'm glad to finally see it in pro play because that means it'll get nerfed although i am a garen enjoyer i have won so many bullshit ranked games off of Garen just this year alone. Um, yeah, so uh, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, Team Liquid. Uh, they <laughs> lost, man. Yeah, that was rough, buddy. Uh, almost, almost got away with it. Almost <laughs> got away with it. If I just distracted him about Garen, I was like 50-50. He doesn't talk about the fact that Liquid lost. But Yeah, I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, okay? I don't... Th I think TL's call at the end of the game was fine. I think it made sense, and I, it almost worked, as you said, right? Literally, 0.1 seconds means, yeah, you guys are pretty close, okay? I'm not going to fault you guys. You didn't do anything that wrong, right? Uh, there's only one thing that could have changed for them, and that was when APA actually recalled about, like, right when they were acing FlyQuest, APA recalled because he was really low. He could have turned and whacked the minions for a little bit, and then gone to the base or then gone to the team fight but that kind of foresight is it's just hindsight analysis literally impossible to think about but i do think it is possible to think about it and that's because they're going for a base race they know it's going to take at least 30 seconds to do which is about the same time as garen's uh death spawn right but death timer and garen they should know that Garen has TP and that it would be possible to TP into the base. So like the calculation there is like, do we think um, Team Liquid has enough time to take the base under Garen's death timer? And I think that they could have made the analysis that as long as they push that wave bot lane, it doesn't matter if Garen spawns and TPs because their recalls are uh, disjointed. So even if Garen spawns, and TL haven't ended the base yet. That means it took them like 45 seconds to like end the base or whatever because they took the extra time to clear the bot wave. TL still wins because Garen 
can't TP to the bot lane, and Garen can't defend because the respawn timers of FlyQuest are all disjointed. Mm. So I, I do would think... push back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I put I put impact there. He has TP. He doesn't need to clear the way. He just needs to stall the way oh, okay. out far enough, yeah. right? Because yeah. the Tristana is so vital to the base race. It's never the, the call is never to bring Tristana elsewhere because she needs to take the turrets down to even. And then the the Cassante doesn't clear, but it does stall the wave further away, so you yeah. can just TP up to join, and then you can also tank the turrets with the minion and the TP. They're, like the TP he made is the most egregious thing of the whole okay. thing. Okay, no, no. So I agree with you if we're talking about later after FlyQuest is fully aced. APA based before FlyQuest got aced. APA could have mm. made mm. a pit mm. stop in bot lane pushed a little bit and then rejoined with his team, they would have lost maybe five to ten seconds. Maybe fifteen. Right? If APA but that could be the difference. A lot of people were spawning. Yeah. In his initial recall, he could have went bot lane for a little mm. bit, then joined his team, and then TP's really and then impacts really troll TP wouldn't have mattered, right? But yes, you're correct. In the okay. second scenario after FlyQuest is fully aced, then yes, Impact should have recalled it would have taken probably five to ten seconds longer to take the base, but Impact would have recalled, pushed the wave out, and then TP'd onto a minion. And then that would have stopped Buzio from pulling the wave as well. So yes. I do so the the first part with APA is a bit harder to call on APA's part because you don't actually know if you're gonna because the, the FlyQuest hasn't been aced yet, right? FlyQuest was still alive when he had based, so that's yeah. harder to see. I do think Impact made the biggest mistake where he should have recalled, should have pushed the wave, held his TP for the wave. Uh, when they're ending, Busio couldn't pull the wave, guaranteed end. Like, there's no way yeah, to actually... He doesn't speed that. up the clear that fast, actually, because he just no. needs... The minion wave was alive enough that he didn't need to tank the turrets, yeah. and he... Yeah, maybe he has Demolish, but, like, he could just use it on the Nexus turret. Like, there's no almost net loss. I would actually say yeah. it's minus five seconds tops if yeah. he doesn't join. So... It I mean, it's also... It's, it's like, so what? easy to say now, but in the yeah. moment, they're like, we win, boys. They just thought they won, and he was just hyped. And he was just like, like let's just wrap this up. Who the hell calculates that the minions are going to base race you and win? Like, I, yeah. I, I, I've i never done that. Yeah. So the real analysis that we have to take away from this is it doesn't matter how Team Liquid played the end of that. Because the real problem was how they played the mid-game. They playing Kaiso Rel, and they let their base get destroyed against the scaling comp. That was the real problem. The real problem was they get caught in the mid-game and game fly quest two Barons. Right? They shouldn't have ever done that. That's the real problem. Honestly, TL was just playing not at 100% this entire series. I remember it was game 3 as well, where the game was very even. They were just getting caught out on repeat and getting solo killed, like we already talked about, right? Young getting solo killed by Seraphine, really bad. Uh, I remember Quarter J and APA, they both face-checked when they didn't need to, and they died, and they gave over dragons and stuff to, to FlyQuest. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots of things here that are just, it's just has nothing to do with the base race, really. Like we, we yep. if, if you're they hyped about it, they did deserve to lose. Because honestly, if they kept playing the way they did, they would have lost game five, right? It was Flyquest was playing cleaner. They were making less mistakes. TL was just making a lot of mistakes, right? Um, I do think if TL wasn't making all these uncharacteristic mistakes, I actually think they're a better team, like in general, on average, right? Just a bit, just a tiny bit. I do think TL on average is a better team just because we have so much data from this year where TL is better than Fly. But hey, <laughs> that's not where it matters. Right? That's not where it counts. a single series to the finals. Yep, and that, that's where it matters oh, the most. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's where it matters the most. And they just didn't show up as well. And also, I do think Inspired gave an interview uh, and Spawn gave an interview where they said that TL was nervous because they hadn't played in a big stadium. Actually, if you think back to it, right. uh, Spring was just a small studio event, right? Uh, there wasn't a huge crowd. Mm. This one had a huge crowd of thundering people. FlyQuest got to warm up the day before, right? The rookies had a whole best of to warm up. I genuinely 100% believe as the TL Coper, because that's what we're doing on this podcast, apparently, is that if Team Liquid... <laughs> I don't know why. I thought it was just going to be me. <laughs> no, no, no. Because I, I fully believe this. I agree in this idea that getting to warm up in front of a big crowd is a big deal. Getting stage games is a big deal. Every pro player <laughs> believes this, too. And I'm going to give... And if I believe that, then TL gets this. If TL got to play a random, trash, nonsensical best of five on the stage the day before... They wouldn't have looked so bad because they were playing nervous. Like the fact that game four dragged on that long before they started making games, uh, or sorry, they started making engages meant the TL was nervous. They were afraid. They were mm -hmm. like, 
they didn't, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen. And they were shitting their pants. When in reality, they should know exactly what happens because they've done this so many times. Um, so I do think that they came in dry. And I actually believe the same thing about Cloud9 last year when Energy beat them. Energy was so warm from all of their series playing. They played like literally, I think, a whole regular season in playoffs compared to Cloud9, who only had played like two series in playoffs last okay. year. Or no, no, I'm talking about last year. Oh, energy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Energy versus Cloud9. So I think it's the same thing where I mean FlyQuest just got more stage games. They got they got to play in front of the crowd. And I think it's really I think lower bracket is the most one of the most powerful buffs you can get in in playoffs. And yeah. I do think ha- Hanma Life got a little bit of that too. If we talk about Hanma Life and Genji, I think they got a little bit of that. The only team that is like immune to like getting lower bracketed is G2 versus Fnatic, right? G2 just wins Fnatic. Like Fnatic could have played 50 games and G2 would still clap them. But like that's the only region. I feel like tons and tons of regions always fall no, to the, the, the lower the bracket. The LPL final is usually just the top the top bracket. The LPL, oh, sh- like BLG, just keeps winning. JDG, like recently, they just yeah. they just That's keep fair. winning. But That's true. That's true. It's just, uh, the, the top team is just so strong, and like until recently it, in Korea, that was never the case. Genji oh, won yeah, four Genji. times in a row. I guess yeah, Genji <laughs> and Genji's always the number one. This seed, split, right? like, yeah. this is normally what happens in NA and EU, mm-hmm. and then this split it happened in LCK. So it happened, yeah. you know, across the board. Um, sorry, it happened in NA in general, and then sometimes. You see a good comp- competition, but then if it's Fnatic going to the low bracket, it's, it's over. Like, don't yeah. don't worry about it. It's just they're not going to do anything. <laughs> the most yeah. harmless eight eight losses in a row rivalry ever. Like, is it a rivalry or is it a beating? I mean, nobody else is making it to finals, so I guess it's a rivalry. <laughs> for them. Yeah, that's I guess it also is. true. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's 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 it. That's LCS. TL will be the number two seed. FlyQuest will be the number one seed. And Hundred Thieves will be the number three seed. They'll be playing R seven and and uh, the play-ins. I think we got a really great play-in draw. Uh, we have R seven yeah. and some team I've literally never heard of, which is always what a good thing. Called? I don't remember. I. I don't know. It's it's. I forget who it is. I feel bad. Oh, okay. But you keep 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 yapping. Okay, I'll keep yapping. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Hundred Thieves. This is a great opportunity for the rookies. This is uh, four players will be brand new to the world stage. Only River has been there before. Um, it's gonna be up to a River to tell all of Hundred Thieves. Hey, we're about to get booty clapped in scrims. Don't let it tilt you. It's okay. This is part of the plan. We just gotta make it through plans and not look like shit. Um, so I think that I'm excited for mm. 100 Thieves to go through plans. Um, I think it's going to be great development for their players. I think they, like, they, this is just what we need for NA, right? We needed a team like 100 Thieves to go through plans and develop because these, this is our future, right? You know, is our future in Cloud9 players? Yeah, maybe, right? But Blabber and Vulcan have been there for a long time. Berserker has already gotten a couple Worlds appearances. You know, it would have been nice to get JoJo in there again. It would have been nice to get Thantos in there again. But, like, we're getting four players to develop at Worlds. I don't expect them to do anything, but I expect them to do something after this. I expect them to develop with their Worlds appearance and take the LCS to the next level in the years coming. So I'm really excited for 100 Thieves, and I'm glad they're going. Um, we got the. I agree. I'm glad they're going. I, I think it would have been nice if we had a coherent C9 because I think that would have been the strongest NA lineup in terms of talent we've seen in a while. Yeah. Hundred Thieves just deserved. They just look better. I mean, also we didn't mention Dignitas has won more games and playoffs than C9 this year in Summerset <laughs> <laughs> against one to one against the same person by the way in the Hundred Thieves. So uh, oh my God. Dignitas might have put up a better fight. I'm just saying that the. the Putting that out into the universe, the Dignitas could have gone to Worlds. I think it. if Dignitas <laughs> beat Hundred Thieves, I think they still would have beaten Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine looked it, that bad. Jensen gets his ultimate revenge. Like that would have been insane. Well, actually, his ultimate revenge is beating FlyQuest. But okay, <laughs> hey, if Dignitas won the split, beating Cloud Nine and FlyQuest and TL, like that would have been hilarious. <laughs> He actually runs the gauntlet. He runs the gauntlet. Puts out a diss track at the end. Like it, yeah, it would have been uh, that would have been, been hype. Legendary. And it'd be like um, Bier- Bierkson who? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So the the world's plans is the other side of the bra- uh, on our in our groups for NA. So if we beat uh, our first round, we would be up against Softbank Hawks. Softbank ah. Hawks is the Japanese team. Mm. They got second in the 
combined Pacific League. Okay, so, so they PSG, they took one game off PSG. Right, PSG is right. the first seed, South Bank Cox is the second seed. So okay. think like Detonation Focus Me, Sengoku, mm-hmm. like this is I guess like, the next iteration. It's the MV team, I believe. Oh, like he's literally okay. on that team. So this team is probably actually quite decent. We cannot we actually probably could not take them as a Joker team. <laughs> so it's much easier than Mad Lions or whatever the other side of the bracket. Mad exactly. Lions PSG is the other two top seeds on the and other side of the bracket. So like those are actual teams, right? Those are actual teams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those G- are Gigabyte actual Marines, teams. right? These days, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, interesting, interesting. Good to know. Uh, so that's play-ins. Um, also wanted to talk about since I just mentioned Bjergsen, it was actually nice to see. It was kind of weird to do it in the finals before the games had even started, but like the all the pros kind of showing up and like the mm. legacy players and the uh, as like a f- kind of farewell to the LCS or like a rebranding, changing and stuff like that. Uh, it was cool to see like what we saw Voivoy for the first time in a long time, um, you know, like Scara and like Pull Belter and uh, a bunch of these guys were showing up, like Smithy and stuff like that, Bjergsen. Um, yeah, how did you feel? What were kind of your, some of your feelings and thoughts seeing all these oldies? I thought it was really fitting. I thought that it was a great end to an era. I think that that is the send off they needed. I think Double Beer coming out with the trophy, absolute cinema. Loved it. Mm. Extremely confused um, why Dominate wasn't out there because they literally put him on broadcast yeah. more than once, like as a customer. He's like, he's stuck with the LCS no matter how good or bad we've been, he has. Yeah. And he's one of the most popular like streamers. So I was yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. He didn't get invited. But other than that, I think they chose the right people to come. Like, I think these are just the people who made the league. Um, there's probably even more they could invite, but who knows? They might just not want to do league anymore, right? So yeah. I, I was like, where's Bjergsen been? Like, good for him. Like, he has not been anywhere. No drama, no yeah. social media, just living his life like a normal person after league, after being one of the greatest players, right? So he doesn't play I was video games super anymore. happy. It was a very yeah. good send off. No. Whoever, um, whoever came up with that, probably Mark C. Absolutely great. Great great decision. Our hey. viewership is up. This is the time to speak about it. Yeah. The, the report came out. It was like, was it 24% or whatever average viewership up or 16 compared yeah. to the comparable last year? Like, I, and I think with the merging of us and Latin American North, the viewership will only go up. But like, for comparable apples to apples, like, absolute win. Like, Dubs. the summer split actually did really well. Dubs all around. And to think of how much better we could have been the summer split, right? We had so many terrible breaks and gaps in the best of three split that yeah. we could have just been even better. We could have gone even higher. We could have gone even further beyond. But um, it's okay. We'll just have to start fresh next year when we have the merger. It's going to be very different. I also felt very nostalgic. Um, I actually felt less so nostalgic, mostly because I watched the co-stream so much that I hear stories about these players all the time. Like, I watched the uh, co-stream with Dominate and um, Sneaky and Medios and Doublelift with Pull Belter. So, like, I watched, like, all of these. I consume so much of this content just, you know, in my daily life that I was like, yeah, it's good to see them. I miss this. But also, I hear stories about them every weekend. <laughs> they're, not, they're not dead, right? It's not like yeah, yeah. When, when in old game, old sports, right, if someone goes off the grid, like, you just don't hear about them. Yeah, there's the internet, right? And like we I get constantly like it's not like I miss double lift because I I fucking see him every weekend. Like I, I watch his stream every weekend, you know. I, mean? I miss Bjergsen. That's with yeah, I, Boy Boy. You know, I'm, I did miss Bjergsen and Voy Boy too, but like also I've been watching a good amount of I will dominate content only because he's been very nostalgic lately and he's been giving so many old stories. Oh my god, hearing old stories about Curse. I don't know if you've watched any of these clips. Yeah, whenever he mentions Piglet, I actually laugh my ass Dude, off. Dude, I time. love Dude. it. I love it. Piglet Dude, lives rent free. Yeah in his head <laughs> it's so funny it's, it's so, so funny, funny. <laughs> Pit, dude okay my one of my favorite things that i will dominate has ever said was when like he's talking about curses in elimination match and piglet he's like pretending he's watching the match right it's like curse academy versus some other academy team it's game five golden glue is their mid laner piglet's the adc piglet turns around and i will dominate this like be like this is what piglet's saying is like golden glue you're never getting the lcs you're trash you're never gonna get there you don't deserve to be here i'm gonna make sure that you don't get there piglet locks in ramus i was like what the fuck are you called that and then i had to remember what actually happened in that he didn't change the language on his uh league client so he thought ramus was soraka and he locked in. He tried to lock in Soraka, and he just locked in Ramus. And he, they just made his support play Ramus, and it was a mistake, and they couldn't take it back. And I was like, 
okay? But it was so funny to be like, Piglet, you're never getting into the... I mean, Golden Glee, you're never getting into the SCS. What a, what a I, psychopath, dude. dude so dominate, funny, I will dominate as a psychopath, and it is hilarious. So, oh, so, also, the, my favorite yeah. story from that whole uh, thing he shared was when Piglet used to tell his support to go kill themselves, like, to go into the bush even though they know they would die. Yeah. And then after they did, it's like, why did you ask him to do it? We knew it was like, I wanted to see if he would listen to me unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's so anime. Who it's does so that? It's so unhinged, man. It's like, so Like, imagine unhinged. if we got this content and, like, had it revealed to us at the time. It would have been so fun. I mean, it's it hilarious was, now, but hilarious the drama, now. like, we already knew Breaking Point, Piglet, like, all those things were yeah. a thing. Yeah. But yeah. who knew that... Who could have imagined that was the tip of the iceberg? Dude, I, I love the fact that I Will Dominate is, like, settled in his career. He's always been toxic, but finally he just lets it all out. He literally He's holds like, nothing back. He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't I will burn the bridges. He just burns everything. Because he'll even burn... Have you heard stuff with Steve and Mark Z? Like, they will just... Apparently, way back in the day... Okay, I don't blame Steve for this, okay? He was in his mid-20s running a company in 2015, Okay. Yep. It's, it wasn't great. He does. It's not like he, he, this is excuse. He was not a, he's not an angel. He's not. He's a not saint. an. No, no. He's a businessman. All right, dude. Uh, it was uh, after <laughs> like 2014 or 2015. Uh, Curse barely didn't make it to Worlds or something like that. Right? They lost Game Five to LMQ. Voivoy Boy oh. was like one v nining, but they barely didn't make it. They got reverse swept, I think. Actually, uh, yeah, it was a they, two zero. Yeah, reverse swept. Yep. Yeah. They went to dinner right after that as a team, and Steve said, all right, I want everybody to go around the table and say if you want to play with this player again next year or not. I was like, that's not going to fly in today's society. Who ever thought that was a good idea? And everybody was just going around being like, yeah, I want to play with this guy. Yeah, I want to play with this guy. And they got to Voy Boy, who was literally 1v9ing that series, and uh, Expecial was like, I don't know if I want to play with Voy Boy. And that was when Voy Boy's career got fucking headshot. Never played another game of his career, except Delta Fox. And I was like, "What? That's how we lost Voy Boy? That's how we ended his career? Because because Ex Special said he didn't want to play with him anymore. And because Steve watched too many motivational movies and thought that that was the play. Is it? Dude, I was so it's, sad about that. But like, yeah. Ex Special, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be fair, they got Phoenix the next year, and Phoenix was great. And then it they, was, but like, yeah, they didn't but need to lose White Boy. They like, didn't it need is... to lose White Boy. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, also apparently Steve had a vendetta against Voy Boy because he moved from uh, top lane to mid lane, and he just thought like, you should just stay in top lane. You're a good top laner. Why do I have to go find a new top laner now? Stuff like that. And I was like, okay, that's a little petty, but damn, bro, you're just gonna get rid of Voidboy like that? Um, and also, I guess Voidboy made, like, a shit ton of money. He made, like, three times X what everybody else made at the time. Um, so, there's yeah, that, too. I can see why people just had tension. Like, maybe he didn't work as hard, even though he was a savant. Like, he was very good. Like, Voidboy, Dude, Boy was he, could move, he could professionally lane swap and, like, play at the top level. This was not a normal thing back then. No, nah, he... Dude, mm -hmm. Voidboy was the GOAT. Voidboy was also, like, the meta, like, the meta understander. People didn't understand team comps and metas back then, either. And he... Yeah, I, I think always Boy Boy got got effed way before his time. He was um, like the diamond of our time, a uh, diamond yeah. box of NA. Yeah, rip, rip that guy. Rip, Anyways, rip, rip. we're talking about Team Liquid from the good days and the bad days and everything in between. That this has been a long, long episode, greatly deserved as so much has happened. Uh, the last thing we need to talk about, I can't believe there's still more, is we know who's leaving next year. It's Energy and Immortals. We all knew Immortals was leaving. This was not. Mm -hmm. A surprise at all we all expected mm -hmm. it we all thought it was going to be either dig or hundred thieves that were going to leave but mm -hmm. hundred thieves made it to worlds i don't think it changed anything but they made it to worlds and it's too late for it to change anything. exactly right and dignitas um they uh didn't leave which is interesting which i guess it makes a bit of sense because they did actually invest in a real roster they just don't mm -hmm. have the staff or management to, to do it but energy being the one to leave give me your first reactions how do you feel about it and then we'll close this i didn't think up. they would i thought that there was enough legacy roster but like they've done stuff recently very recently they won they were the hope and Dude. i don't think it was just nrg's fault like yes they were lowering their investment most people were it's yeah. just they stuck to a roster without the amount of coaching and the apparently the coaching was the difference maker or the meta, right? So yeah. I, I, that was not my top vote. I was always thinking Immortals and Dig or Immortals and maybe 100 Thieves, right? Those, those, that's what I had in the cards because yeah. it just looked like those rosters just never really cared 
about yep. League that much. This was not their main game. And yeah, I, I thought that Dig was like always one foot out the door, except for this play where they, you know, spent relatively on like some names and then they continued to suck ass. Yep. Like who who's a Dig fan except for the memes, right? Yeah, I'm a fan of Dig because it's funny to be a fan of Dig. It's not because I actually care if they win or lose. It's just kind of funny. But at the same time, energy leaving, um, it's a bit of CLG leaving part two, right? Because they took on the CLG mantle. They took mm -hmm. on so many of the old CLG players in the top side, right? Um, they won in their first split back after you know being gone for so long. And apparently, a lot of energy behind the scenes knew that energy was leaving before it got officially announced. So mm -hmm. we can do a bit of retrospective and a bit of backtracking. I'm going to apologize just a tiny bit to the players of NLG in that I understand why you might play worse knowing that you're not going to have a job next year. Your org's not going to be here next year. That is a different level of stress to play against. Obviously, the best players should still play at their best regardless of circumstances, but can I blame these mid-20-year-olds being told, hey, you don't have a job, but uh, keep playing your heart out. You got to finish this playoffs. Hope you get to Worlds, buddy. Like, that's really hard. That's really rough. So um, I think it sucks. I, I think it does suck for the energy players to know that behind the scenes and not be able to say anything and still have to play like everything's fine. So pretty rough. Agreed. Um, I think in retrospective, 100 Thieves probably stayed in now that we know the result because they also have a very good Valorant roster. You know, it's made Masters. It's like gone into the top four, top eight in NA multiple mm -hmm. times. And I think they probably think for the sake of Valorant, which they do think is like something that they're invested in, something that is growing still and still big esport, you yeah. probably don't want to piss off Riot by like saying we're divesting, right? Um, if you're not at the bottom of the barrel, right? And then, you know, they... Okay, they didn't know they were going to make it, but they had chances, right? They already were top two in the regular season before. So, like, I think there was enough factors that barely tipped it over the scale in that case. Uh, for NRG, yeah, it's done. I, I, I don't want... I think at least contracts definitely should get another chance. I hope that Palafox gets another chance on a maybe a low-tier roster, but it's a chance to, like, rebuild and not have to be under that much stress and, you know, try another meta, right? Some people are just extremely good at some metas. Yeah. And I just, like, refuse to believe that a guy at that level just, like, drops off that hard it, under a good coach, too. Like, a yep. coach itself. Yeah. I, I have to agree with the Palafox part. Like, he was the most egregious drop-off. And, it, you know, I think all the CLG players have always had a mental thing. It's always mental, right? The mental is holding them back from literally being champions to being the worst in the league. And we saw that in real time, where Palafox went from the best to the absolute worst, and now we might know why, and I would love to give him another chance. If he sucks next year, then I'm probably done with him, right? But if he can keep it going next year, I will just say, hey, this was a really bad year from you. Just turn it around, right? Um, contracts, I think he deserves another spot. Honestly, I do think FBI and Huhi, maybe not together, maybe together, I don't know, should get more chances. They are still good enough, mm, I think. That's true. Dokla, I don't think I would be sad to see him gone. I just, he is, even when they won, he was just never good enough. Like, when he won LCS, it was like, man, he was just holding it together barely, right? Man, he was it's just... Armut. Yeah, he is a little bit Armut. Yeah, <laughs> he's a little bit of Armuddy, you know? Um, <laughs> all right. Anything else for LCS? Man, what a long podcast. What a banger of the last two weeks. Um, LCS. No, I, I would just say that Mark C has made it more entertaining. This was the fun his year in memory in terms of just the game quality, the narratives, the prose has been a hit. I love watching them just talk to each other. It was awkward at first because they just obviously don't have the camera presence, yeah. but they're building it. I think they need to tone down showing chat in games in the, the way they're doing it because it's a little too forced. But still, I think the general concept is good i, I want to see chat i want to see them yap at each other they're just not good shit talkers they're not like season two to five where it's like dude these guys are unhinged yeah. these guys are like gonna get canceled but this is so <laughs> funny yeah. uh the kind of shit you would see like imagine if we had all chat all the time from season two on where i think league would be huge still <laughs> yeah because like the storylines yeah. would continue like the the people shit talking Bjergsen when he's or double if when he's at a bad split or something like that. That one TSN split where they randomly won even though they were dog, yeah. they're all the way. Dude, imagine the all chat all the way through. I would have paid money yeah. to see Piglet versus Double If and oh, chat. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Anyways, that's all I'm saying. I it, it's a little too late. They turn on Twitch subs too late, but you know we're we're starting to nature's healing. Ah uh, yeah, it is too late, huh? Oh my god, Twitch subs! I can't believe they just started that. Like, when did they just do that? Ten years ago, bro. <laughs> no, we did. no, no, no. You actually, we used to have them. When really? League was huge with 500k people. They used to have Twitch subs. They turned it off when they were like, "We're a real sport. We're not oh, going to do this stuff." Franchise. So they actually bullshit. lost years of income, like mm. years of income and integrations and ways to monetize. Because yeah, the Twitch sub money itself not actually a game changer, but the fact that people were willing to pay money to LCS and then there were ways to activate and engage dedicated fans, it was just like so backwards to like hey. take free money thrown at you and be like i don't want this i don't want differentiation i don't want any ways to monetize and we're just gonna lose money on our esport even though yeah. we make skin money and don't share it like i mean it's so prime do, do you know how much they would have cooked with prime subs people just give that out it's free it's just give it out like, it's candy. like candy yeah and, LC, and back then lcs was like the major entertainment most people it, were watching like so many people I watching in chat every month i would have given my prime over my twitch prime. i, I don't care. i would have forgot care. i was like you guys have taken whatever dollars of prime money for me or well half every I, yeah literally don't care about my twitch subscriptions ever i would have given my prime hands down not even thought about it exactly right like, i think a lot of people would have done that so it, it is I'm really so baffling excited. anyways it, but hey leaving it an up note lcs is healing we have a new champion to reign in congrats to FlyQuest. they have been chasing this for a long time and i think it's great to enter a new era with a new champion and like someone who's been trying to get this for so long and they finally mm -hmm. do it we have to Give props to Whippo in that he has faced so much criticism and he actually manages to do it against the GOAT, against Impact. It's not hard. It's not easy to do that. He entered. He showed in that series it was not easy to do. So congrats to him. Congrats to FlyQuest. Uh, and congrats to Inspire to being just the actual GOAT. Congrats to Quad. First split in the LCS wins. There's something about that. I think future rosters should consider just getting a person for the first time and just winning the split. Uh, it seems really good to do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then kick them. And get another one. Him. Yep. Congrats get, to Moz. Get quad with an O. Yeah, quad. Okay. Get queed. Or that sounds wrong. Ugh. All right. Okay. Let's, 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 that's too need, close to it. We need to end. We need to end. <laughs> we we need to end, end now. <laughs> okay. Try not to be too toxic, guys. We'll see you at Worlds. Play-ins, baby. Let's and we'll go. see you in the next episode. Peace.